for our last session for the day for the rugged individuals in track. And as I've been introducing each, each speaker, I've, as I've said before, uh, the idea behind the rugged individuals in track is to highlight the efforts of individuals to uh, in, uh, in producing a valid space project. And uh, of course, with today's environment, uh, the role of the individual has become much more important. And in fact, a large part of our conference emphasis has been to try and compare and contrast what's happening on the government and big, big business side compared to what's been happening with uh, space projects on the, on the volunteer side and, uh, uh, and uh, on the entrepreneur side. Um, that includes uh, providing vision for, for the future. And I can't think of anyone who the word visionary doesn't apply to more than Marshall Savage. Uh, Marshall is the author of the Millennial Project, uh, Colonizing the Galaxy in e Eight Easy Steps is the subtitle of this book. And uh, that book came out in 1992. And uh, while perhaps not, did, uh, it was still published in fact in 1992, uh, was not a runaway bestseller, but was an influential book. Uh, the book was eventually published by Lillian Brown in 1994. Marshall went on to form the first Millennial Foundation, and uh, that is a group uh, that is pursuing his goals for, for colonizing space. And it's a very fascinating uh, enterprise that, that he's laid out, and uh, a very interesting vision that I'm sure that you'll, uh, you'll enjoy hearing about. Uh, I just want to mention also that uh, in August of, uh, August of this year, uh, Marshall will be presiding over the fourth annual conclave of the first foundation that will be August 2 to 4 of this year in Colorado Springs. And uh, there is, in fact, an East Coast New York City chapter of the, uh, of the, of the, of the uh, Millennial Foundation that will be be meeting tonight later on. Uh, is that in, uh, uh, which restaurant is that in? Does that somebody know? Right. It's in TGI Fridays, which is just up the street here on the 42nd. So uh, uh, you can talk with Marshall or, or one of his other people afterwards. And, uh, uh, get together with them. Anyway, I'd like to introduce Marshall Savage. Thank you, Greg. I guess I'm going to have to hang out down here. This is the remote, right? Um, finally, I get to speak in a track that I feel like I really belong in. Rugged individuals. Is there a... Uh, can I move the mic down? Yes. Okay. here. Um, I guess I really got on this track about 20 years ago when I went to my first ISDC meeting, which I think was the first ISDC meeting uh, that uh, Jerry McNeil held up at Princeton. And it was just a little one-track conference. I think there were only 30 or 40 people there. And it sort of seemed to me like the Woodstock of uh, space compensation. O'Neill was there and Prima Dyson uh, Peter Glazer, who I guess is running around here somewhere 20 years later, uh, was there. Uh, Eric Rexler was there, and he was just a punk kid like me at, the, at that time, an undergraduate at Cornell. And it was a wonderful, exciting vision that O'Neill laid out for us. Um, and this came at a, at a time of uh, basically despair regarding the American space program because Apollo was basically dead. It was the, the early to mid-70s, and Agnew was going down, and Nixon was going down in flames, and they were taking the space program with them. And so uh, I was ready to, to sign up with Jerry and, and go to L5, but the problem was, and, and it bothered me at that early meeting 20 years ago, I really didn't see how we could get there from here. And. Uh, so, rugged, rugged individuals being what they are, I basically went my merry way for about 10 years waiting for L5, the other space advocacy groups, to get things going and build us a space infrastructure so you know, I could make my fortune and emigrate to outer space and live happily forever ever after in a space colony. Well, in 1985, it became pretty obvious that uh, A, the fortune building wasn't going according to plan, and B, neither was the space colonization. And so I sat down on my 30th birthday and crawled in under the barbed wire at uh, Stonehenge to commune with my Druid ancestors and figure out what the hell I was going to do next. And basically I decided, above all things in life, I want to see this dream come true. 
And I didn't know what I could do to help make that happen, but I knew I basically had to devote myself to this process and do what I could to try to get humanity into space. And so I spent about five years writing this book and ultimately got it published. And over the last few years, I've been incredibly busy trying to build the, the kernel of a human organization that can ultimately grow to become something that makes this process happen. It's an impossible task on its face. I realize that, I'm the first to admit, but it must be undertaken nonetheless. There's some brave souls here in this room who have made the same uh, essential commitment that I have. And if any of you have that bone in your head that says, hurt me, and want to join up for this thing, you're welcome to join us tonight and, and talk about the foundation. A lot of you are familiar with this program from either the book or haven't heard me talk before or something. So I'll go through the, the essence of the Millennial Project fairly quickly, and then hopefully we can engage in a discussion as to the appropriateness of this path and these methods uh, to get to where I think we're all trying to ultimately go. Can you turn the slide deck around for me? Somebody have the lights? point of departure um, where I separated company from the O'Neill plan is my feeling that in order to get started on the space colonization process we ought to start by colonizing this planet first. It's a lovely planet, uh, although a bit crowded. If you look at it from a space colonization standpoint, it has a lot of possibilities. There's still a lot of places on planet Earth where you could build colonies, self-sufficient, economically producing, politically autonomous colonies, they just all happen to be on the Earth's oceans. The, the essential technology that I think will open the oceanic frontier for us is OTEC, Ocean Thermal Energy Conversion. Your government has already spent about 700 million of your dollars researching the viability of this technology and demonstrating that it will actually work. Um, this is a cross-sectional view of an open cycle OTEC that would produce about 100 megawatts of net electrical power. It's really a fairly simple machine in, uh, in concept. It exploits the temperature difference between the warm surface water of the oceans and the deep water 3,000 feet below. Warm water is pulled in at uh, I there and it enters the low pressure chamber at B where a small percentage of the water flashes to steam at the 80 degrees of the ambient temperature. It's demisted, passing through the baffles at B, and runs the turbine blades there at D. Once it gets past the turbine blade, just like in a conventional steam plant, uh, that produces the power, runs the dynamo, produces the net electricity. The vapor stream passes over chill tubes at E. They are kept cold by a constant flow of cold water pumped from 3,000 feet deep up the pipe there at G. The beautiful thing about this technology is that it gives you three vital commodities that make the ocean frontier a viable place for space colonization. Obviously, you get the power. Because the vapor condenses on the chiller tubes, it's also a desalination plant, so you get a tremendous flow of fresh water and it's bringing a huge flow of cold water to the surface, and that turns out to be the most valuable part of the process of all. If you contain the cold water at the surface, you can undertake mariculture on a large scale. What you're looking at here is an artist's rendition of what a full-scale sea colony built on OTEC technology might look like. Out around the colony are these large floating membrane containment ponds that hold the cold water up in the sunlit surface long enough for algae to bloom and the rest of the food pyramid to take off. Um, with the fresh water, the energy, and the mariculture, I believe that the open oceans are a viable frontier for space colonization. Um, in the book, I described how we can actually grow the space colony, the sea colonies, out of the materials uh, 
in the water, more or less like a feeding a seashell, and it's a lot easier than trying to haul our, haul our materials out there in the middle of the ocean with us. The object of the exercise is to be able to create nothing less than a new civilization at sea. The reason being that I believe the space colonization effort is on the scale of human history, one of the greatest things mankind has ever undertaken. I don't think it can be done by a club or a corporation or a religion or any of these small entities that populate our society. It's the work of a great nation. Obviously, our particular great nation, the United States, is essentially out of the space settlement business, almost out of the space business entirely. It's going to require some human movement that is on the same scale as the proposition we're undertaking. If, as I project in the book, these colonies become economically viable, economically profitable, they will proliferate and provide ultimately living space for as many as tens of millions of human beings. That could provide us the basis for a civilization that could then undertake spacefaring on a large scale. One of the other things I think that we need to do, and the more experience I have with, uh, with human beings and groups, the more I'm convinced of this, is we need to undertake a lot of social evolution along the way. I'm not quite sure how we would fare if we gathered all the people in this room together and stuck us in a small, self-contained habitat in outer space where we were dependent on each other for our lives. Uh, how long would it be before we were... Uh, that's the first generation, that's the... Pardon me? Not past the first generation, that's <laughs> that, that, That's part of, the, part of the problem, I think. And, and of course, it's a, in, in a way, it's a little discouraging because what I'm saying is that it will take us at least another generation to unfold the infrastructure necessary to undertake the space colonization process. I don't know about your kids, but I don't want my kids coming and going in and out of the airlock. They don't even know to shut the darn thing. If they grow up in a space colony and learn to shut the airlock on their way out where everybody dies, they're probably a little better adapted to the space environment than our present earthbound uh, um, people are. Um, so I'm not, I'm not su suggesting colonizing beneath the sea. That's a lot tougher than space colonization. But by living at sea, we can learn a lot of the lessons we need to know before we undertake living in space. The next step in the Millennial Project is to get cheap access to space, and this is something that an awful lot of people are working on and thinking about, and there are a lot of terrific ideas, single stage to orbit, uh, Roton is now coming to the, to the forefront. And there are a lot of great ideas about how to get people and mass off the planet uh, economically. In the book, I describe a combination magnetic maglev launch system and laser propulsion system to put payload into orbit. Um, True rocket scientists have reworked the, the ideas in the book and come up with repairs that actually make it feasible. Apparently the idea, the, the concept that I outline in the, the book would turn into mush on your way to orbit, which would be unfortunate for most of the passengers. But uh, if you're interested in that, I'd invite you to log on to our website and, and download a paper by a man named Eric Lee who's done a, a wonderful job of repairing what we call the Bifrost Bridge and making an actual feasible system a low-cost launch to space. Um, once we get there, I'm proposing low-cost, low-maintenance, easy-to-construct habitats that are a significant point of departure from some of the designs that have been circulating since O'Neill's days. I'm proposing essentially a low-pressure, oxygen-filled, water-shielded, membrane bubble space habitat simply to enclose the, the, the breathable space that we need. And it's built in a redundant style, so it's basically bubbles nested within bubbles um, and does not produce artificial gravity on its uh, interior. It'd be a dramatically different lifestyle than that we are used to. That's one of the reasons I'm proposing that it be inhabited by a generation of people who have grown up in sea colonies and are accustomed to long-term life in zero gravity, that we deal with the problems of zero gravity, decalcification, et cetera, directly, rather than the brute force approach of spinning the whole habitat to create artificial gravity on, uh, on the interior. 
the inevitable result of this would be that people who inhabit space colonies would be fundamentally different than people who inhabit the surface of the Earth. And I'm not sure that that's an entirely bad thing. Um, the next step in the, uh, the transition is uh, lunar colonization. And I'm proposing to take the same technologies and the lessons that we learned in orbital space colonies and apply them to the lunar surface, dome over lunar craters, terraform the interior, build artificial atmospheres under enclosed domes on the lunar surface, and inhabit those as essentially Earth-like space um, on the moon. Again, like the, uh, like the orbital colonies, it will be a dramatically different style of living than what we are accustomed to on the Earth. And a hundred years from now, several generations from now, Lunarians will be essentially a di almost a different species than the people who live on Earth. Unless you took dramatic countermeasures, if you were born in lunar gravity and lived in a low pressure lunar gravity environment all of your life, it would be fatal to come to Earth. Um, I'm not sure that uh, the Lunarians will, uh, will be interested. Um, there's been a lot of speculation. I, I missed the, the Artemis project presentation, but um, a lot of ideas have been circulating about how to inhabit the lunar surface. And uh, to keep it short, I don't think it's as difficult as it has been mapped out to be. One of the interesting pieces of data that has come to light recently is that there may be uh, available ice trapped in the cold traps of the lunar poles. If anybody knows anything current about this, I'd sure, sure like to hear an update. If that's true, it's going to make the lunar colonization step that much easier. The next step out, of course, is uh, the colonization of Mars. Uh, Martin Fogg is wandering around here somewhere. Oh, there he comes. He's wandering in. Um, he can tell you in much more detail what the best method for transforming Mars into an Earth-like world would be. Um, there are, again, numerous good ideas about how that can be undertaken, erecting orbital parasols over the lunar poles to vaporize the polar ice caps, etc. In my book, I propose the direct approach by arranging collisions between uh, short-period comets and the Martian surface. Martin assures me that that won't actually work. Um, I'm not sure what the best method will be, but the point is that sometime, early, fairly early in the next millennium, I think we can count on seeing the planet Mars transformed into a new Earth-like environment. The next step outward in the progression is the settlement of the asteroid belt. Um, I really think that this is the inevitable Wild West frontier of the next thousand years. This is where the main settlement of the uh, solar system is going to take place, simply because it's where all the stuff is. This is where the resources are. If civilization grows significantly beyond its cur current uh, earthbound limitations, there are ultimately going to be billions of billions of people living in the solar system. Obviously, the Earth can barely accommodate 5 billion. Uh, 10 or 20 billion is probably the upper limit. The Moon and Mars are, are similarly limited. So if the human race is going to grow to significant proportions, it's going to have to do that out in the asteroid belt. That's the only place where we've got the room to undertake it, and that's where the resources are. Um, again, it's the process of taking the same techniques that we learned in orbital colonization and lunar colonization and applying them directly to the asteroid belt, encapsulating whole asteroids in water-shielded uh, uh, pressurized membranes and terraforming their surfaces. What you're looking at here is an artist's concept of what it would be like if you could mine out one of the asteroids, removed all of the valuable minerals, and then terraform both the inner and, uh, and outer surfaces. From a uh, civilization supporting standpoint, the solar system is really a resource-rich environment. Uh, one of the principal commodities that might be limiting in terms of human development is uh, that of water. If you take a look at the Jovian moons, you find something on the order of several hundred times 
the amount of water that we have on the surface of the Earth. By building mining facilities on those moons and exporting the water to the inner solar system, we can support a fairly large population. Uh, from power source, I'm proposing that we extract solar energy directly from the sun uh, by, by covering solar collection panels directly over the, uh, the solar surface. These are supported uh, by the pressure of sunlight. The electric power is converted to a transportable form, microwaves or lasers, and then beamed out to the uh, asteroid belt where it can be put to some uh, practical use. Uh, the same man, Eric Lee, who is prolific as, as well as uh, ingenious, uh, actually did a uh, master's paper on this idea. Uh, at build-out, the solar collectors would form what I call Dyson shells that uh, essentially surround the sun with solar collector material supported by the sunlight. Uh, this would reach out to about a third the distance to Mercury, which puts the shells well outside the, the range of any large solar flares. It collects the 95% of solar energy that's basically being wasted trying to warm up the galaxy. You, as long as you leave a gap along the ecliptic that is one solar diameter, from any planetary surface in the solar system, you would not be able to tell that the shells were there. You can still go down to the beach on a nice, bright, sunny day and get a tan because the light that is illuminating the ecliptic would still be there. But we'd be capturing, essentially, the entire solar output of the sun. <laughs> Uh, Eric tried to, my idea for the, the way to do this was to use some sort of support structure out in this thin solar sail material, essentially, and use it to support a central collecting plant where you converted the energy into laser or microwave for export. He tried to get the numbers to work and couldn't really do it because you're working essentially with saran wrap. So even with nanotechnology and Buckminster fullerene fibers and so forth, he couldn't support any weight on the solar sail material. So instead, he suggested that you build a very thin uh, laser-emitting diode material so that the entire surface collects solar energy and then converts it directly to, and emits it as laser energy over the entire surface. That would take a, a great act of synchronization to keep the whole surface in phase but one of the interesting things he found is that if, if you, in fact, succeed in doing that, then you have a laser-emitting diode that's 20 million kilometers in diameter and has a focal length of about 10,000 light years. The, the end result is that there's a whole new, a whole new uh, arena of uh, celestial engineering that has come up that has applications for these, these astronomical uh, uh, laser projections, everything from roasting vogons at 5,000 light years to, uh, to propelling whole star systems out of the galaxy for intergalactic travel. And some of that, is, that good stuff is loaded up on our website and will be coming out in our, our newsletters and, and so forth. It's, uh, it's an intriguing idea. I'd always thought that there was essentially no danger to a civilization once they had attained uh, basically solar status in their own solar system because Obviously, if someone wanted to invade you and you had the power and resources of your sun available, it's the, the Napoleonic dictum that, that battles are incidental to the, the questions of supply. There's no way they could bring enough stuff to do you any harm. Uh, now I'm not so sure. <laughs> anyway, anyone within 10,000 light years can, can uh, basically do us a lot of harm. So the next time you hear Star Wars, just think of that more literally. This is, I think, where we're heading with this, this unfolding progression. And one of the things I'd be interested in is, is getting the feedback from this particular group of people about, about this, per, this history, this future history of mankind, which essentially calls for us to continue our present rate of growth, which is around 2% annually, over the next 500 to 5,000 years, until the human population reaches a point where it's essentially using the resource base of this solar system on the same scale that we are presently using the resource base of this planet, although fairly unwisely. 
uh, a Soviet astrophysicist named Kardashev divided human civilization into three broad epochs. Kardashev level one, which is where you use essentially the resources of a planet. And that's what we are approaching now. At five to 10 billion people, this planet is going to be tapped out in terms of its energy resources and, and, and others. Partnership level two is using the entire, at least energy and material resources of the solar system, capturing the solar energy, mining the available planetesimals, etc. Of course, partnership level three is using the entire energy and resource base of a galaxy. So what I'm saying is that in a couple of thousand years, once we are free of the confinement of gravity well and civilization is able to grow to this scale, I think that it very well might. Um, essentially, we'll be creating uh, a miniature galaxy here inside the solar system. This is more or less what our solar system would look like at full Kardashev level 2 development seen from the moons of Jupiter. You're looking back through the sunlight being screened through billions and billions of individual habitats in orbit around the sun at the distance of the asteroid belt and looking clear across the solar system at the light being reflected off of the solar shields on the other side. Personally, I think it's not only desirable, but essential that this, um, this history unfold, or something like it. That is, that we achieve this level of development as a people. The reason being simple economics and simple physics. We find ourselves in a universe that is so unbelievably huge that I think without that level of development, we are foreclosed forever from the stars. This is a scale diagram of the local solar neighborhood showing the Earth clouds to scale four point something light years to the nearest star. At, at Apollo rates of travel, that's a million year proposition. There's some interesting discussion I heard a little bit about this morning about world ships. Well, my feeling about world ships is that if you can't travel at least 10% of the speed of light, don't bother going. Because if you do, someone who stayed at home is going to invent better technology and blow your doors off to the next star system, and you're going to have the unpleasant experience of watching for generations while a new Kardashev level civilization grows up at your home star. And when you show up, they're going to have a big party and a great laugh. <laughs> So if you're going to go rapidly, that means that you have to pay the freight. And it's very expensive, as anyone who's used FedEx knows, to get there overnight. To travel to the next star system at half the speed of light, and of course stop at the other end, just the raw energy calculation at five cents a kilowatt hour, which is basically the commodity price for electricity, is something on the order of $120 trillion per person. And that's a one-way ticket. Folks, you don't get to come back for your $120 trillion. Probably get lots of little salt and almonds, though. To undertake that as a planetary civilization is just out of the question. That's the, that's the gross planetary product for the entire decade of the 1980s, $120 trillion. For us, it's impossible. The, the analogy that, that I like to use is consider if we were the size of bacteria. If we were the size of the bacteria, the Earth would be about the size of this room. Um, let me see if I can reconstruct this. Oh, sorry, I can't. I can't remember the the analogy. The, the, what's that? It's really, really big. Yeah. Um, the, the, the basic idea is that the inner, for, for bacteria, the next star system is essentially as far away as Mars is for us. So for us to contemplate star travel is like bacteria contemplating interplanetary travel. It's just off their scale. It's not something that they can do. So we need a very large civilization to do it. For a Kardashev level two civilization to undertake a, a large expedition to the next star system in terms of our economy is something like sending a bus from coast to coast. So without doing that, I don't think we'll ever get to the stars at, at least anything but uh, scientific instrument patterns. Once we get there, I think we use the toolkit that we developed here in the solar system 
and the tools, the, the techniques we learned by terraforming Mars and building civilization here to transform the planets and the planetesimals we find there into new civilizations and new Earth-like world. If mm, 30 or 40,000 years from now, you were to step back and look at our arm in the Milky Way galaxy, you would see something like this. I'm not suggesting it would actually be green in, in visible light, but you would see something weird going on in our neighborhood of the galaxy as human civilizations spread out and colonized thousands of stars around our home system. There would be some kind of signature. Obviously, if you cap off a star with those Dyson shells and then surround it with billions of habitats, uh, the, the solar energy is going to be degraded. This is what Dyson was talking, Freeman Dyson was talking about when he talked about the, the Dyson spheres. He wasn't talking about an engineered structure that surrounds a star. He was talking about the presence of civilization on such a scale that it redshifts its home star. And uh, this process he calls the greening of the galaxy, I think is going to take place literally. The, the thing, the question that comes to mind then is, well, if we can do this in a relatively short period of time, geologically speaking, given the age of the galaxy, why hasn't this happened already? The galaxy is something like 10 billion years old. We will be able to settle the entire galaxy at a relatively modest rate of progression in just a million years. You have to wonder, you know, why the Betelgeusians aren't here already. And, you know, the X-Files notwithstanding, I get the distinct impression that there's no evidence that, that anyone who's visiting us or ever has. And uh, I think we should continue the, the work of CETI and keep looking, but there's no evidence yet that there's any discernible signal. The one thing I can guarantee you is that a thousand years from now, someone will point a radio telescope back at our Kardashev level two civilization. They are going to be bombarded by such a storm of radio noise, it's unbelievable. How many FM stations will be broadcasting? I don't know. Actually, the Earth already outshines our own sun in radio. So there should be some signature if there's somebody out there. My feeling is that we're entirely alone in this proposition, and we're going to have to do it all ourselves. The burden is, is on us. And um, that's really the, the essence of the cosmic imperative that has me on this very individualistic trail that I've taken. Why do we need to do this? It may very well be that the entire fate of life itself is in the hands of this half-finished species we call humanity. And it might be up to us to take the seeds of life off of this planet and establish them elsewhere. As Jim will be able to tell you in detail in his upcoming book, was it Jim, the Doomsday Asteroid? This planet is threatened, and seriously threatened, and it's going to be hit repeatedly in geologic time. So if we don't do something and get life off of this planet and established elsewhere in space, ultimately life may be a mortal force. And unless we find out and get out there and determine that there really is life somewhere else, all we know is that it exists here, and it could become extinct. And the magnitude of the tragedy you basically go from a living universe to one that is ultimately dead. Until we find out different, the onus is on us to do something about it. So this progression needs to unfold over the next thousand years. Um, I thought 20 years ago that I was witnessing the beginning of that process. And of course, it didn't happen. We need to make it happen. And and in the foundation, we're doing what little we can to get there. And if we can get the sea colonization process started so that we have a viable seed that is then able to grow under its own power, maybe we can get there from here. Uh, I'd really like to get your questions and, and your input into the, in the ideas and the, and the process. Mark. I was just clapping, Marshall. Oh, my question. Yeah, I'm sorry, Mr. Well, Savage, when do you foresee uh, the beginnings of all this uh, with Aquarius actually taking, taking effect? 
Well, the, the interesting thing about Aquarius is that it's an economically viable project. It's not like a space colony that, you know, well, it would be great if we built it, but how do we make any money? The, the nature of the OTEC and the, the, the concentration of resources in the oceans is such that if we do this thing and get the process kicked off, then it becomes economically self-sustaining. That's what I think makes the rest of the progression possible. That's what kind of set me on this path 20 years ago, was looking at the question and saying, well, this is great, but how are we going to do this? How are we going to physically undertake to get into space and do space colonization? I didn't see the answer to it, and spent a lot of time thinking about it and mulling it and looking at the various ideas that were out there to try to find the solution. And the space colonization scenario is the best that I have been able to come up with that is a viable path that we can step on today, build a small working prototype that demonstrates the technologies in the here and now, and then scale that up and grow that to create a platform for ourselves from which we can get the space. Yes? Is it going to be a sequential process? I mean, uh, first a sea colony, then orbital colonies, then a lunar colony, then Mars. Yes, I think it, it necessarily must be because you need so much to get to the next step. But one of the big questions that we have all faced all along through the space process is the question of well, where does the money come from? How do you pay for it? The, the answer has to be that you create the new wealth that is necessary along the way. That's why I think the, space, the sea colonization phase is necessary because it takes billions and billions of dollars in order to get into space. Yeah. I don't know what time scale we're we talking about here. I mean, it's the, from the sea space colonization space phase should unfold during the span of our active careers, basically the next 20 to 30 years. If things go rapidly, we can be out there with a full-scale colony in 20 years. Ten years beyond that, there can be hundreds, perhaps even thousands of the colonies. Essentially, an Aquarian League, a political league of millions of people, a new nation. Um, beyond that, getting the, the orbital launch systems built and, and self-sustaining orbital colonies, I think that falls beyond the 50-year time horizon. But just as with the sea colonies, I think you have to have the sequential development because each stage makes the next one possible. One problem I had with O'Neill's idea is he wanted to put the space colonies out at L5, which has a lot to recommend it. It's gravitationally stable, uh, etc. but it's far away. It's as far away from the Earth as the Moon. And what do you do out there that, that makes it an economically viable community? Whereas if you put the space colony in orbit, and you put it in geosynchronous orbit, there are an awful lot of things that you can do that close to Earth and that close to markets that make it an economically viable proposition. The analogy that I use in the book, and I remember this one, is uh, that of the Knights Templar in the Holy Land. Here were these educated men on a holy crusade, and they went down to Palestine, and they built these castles and fought Saracens and so forth. If they had been clever enough to indulge in the spice trade while they were there, they could have made a huge fortune. How is a, a Venetian merchant going to compete with that? He's got to deal with pirates. He doesn't have anybody on the ground. He's got to pay whatever price for the spices is demanded at the end of the camel train. So they could take whatever portion of that market they wanted because they're the men on the spot. The analogy for space colonists in geosynchronous orbit is the telecommunications market. And no one in their right mind would found a company and sell stock on the proposition, well, we're going to put 10 or 100,000 people in a self-sustaining city in orbit in order to make a buck in the telecommunications market. And the first question the investor is going to ask is, well, why don't we launch a satellite instead? So you would never do that if you were just setting out to make money in telecommunications. But if you're the people on the spot, and you're building a civilization in orbit because that's what you're doing and that's your holy crusade, then believe me, one of the things you can do there is kick anybody's socks off in the telecommunications market. They can't possibly compete. You can take whatever share of that market is available. And that's just an example of why being in Geosync is a better place to be than going to clear out to L5. The tourism and space manufacturing and so forth. Although there are a lot of problems being in geosynchronous orbit, I think it's the necessary next step. And what that does for you in terms of the progression 
is now, if you're building a civilization in geosynchronous orbit, you're creating for yourself a viable commodities export market from other locations in the inner solar system. Suddenly, if you've got a lot of people immigrating to geosynchronous orbit, now there's a viable market for lunar oxygen. There's also a viable market for hydrogen and nitrogen and carbon from the Apollo Animal Asteroids. So you're going to have enterprising people going out and establishing mining camps and settlements on those objects in order to support the infrastructure in geosync. And that ultimately leads to the point where you have lunar civilization. Yeah? There are a number of groups in the neo-pagan movement that are interested in creating some type of eco-futuristic village that could be implemented during the next five years on a, a, on a terrestrial site um, as sort of an intermediate step between festival and conference, uh, festivals and conferences that exist now and these more ambitious projects. How much interest do you have in terrestrial and professional communities that would make use of the technologies and you know, basically everything that has come along since the 60s? learning from the mistakes that we made in the past and looking at right now. His question is about uh, the, the neo-pagan movement and, 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 and air, intentional air, communities. Air, air, air futuristic villages that make use of solar technology, these bioregenerative bio yeah. systems, and, 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 well, and, and leading into this. We have a lot of interests that are in parallel, and we actually have a speaker who's an expert in intentional communities coming to our conclave this year to talk about kind of the, the overview of what's been done in the past and what some of the mistakes were. And this prototype colony that we were, we were planning to build at St. Croix, the, the best way to describe it is the miniature version of the Aquarius Sea Colony would basically be biosphere on the beach um, for about 100 people. Now we're looking at other locations like uh, Grand Cayman to build that prototype colony. That's one of the things that we want to do is work out the nuts and bolts of how do you build an interdependent community like this. One of the things that I think is exciting is that we've basically been conducting our affairs as a society the same way since the agricultural era. If you go to a small town and you sit there and you listen to the city council members drone on, it's no different than it would have been in a medieval village uh, 500 years ago, perhaps more democratic, but the essential functions of society haven't changed, and here we are with computer and telecommunications capabilities that are doubling every 18 months. And essentially, the social question is one of data exchange, and, and that goes for education, economics, politics, and much social interaction. Here we have these tools at our disposal that we've never used on the community scale. There has never been a cybernetically wired community yet, and there's an opportunity for this experiment. And so that's one of the things that we want to undertake, is the demonstration of what a true millennial community would look like in this prototype colony. <coughs> Yes. Um, sure. One of the one of the things I didn't get into in terms of the the Aquarian model is that rather than just doing mariculture, which is basically clam and crabs and high end uh, commodities, we want to short circuit the, the the typical food chain structure and get right down to the base because it's much more efficient. Basically, every time you take a step up the food chain, you lose an order of magnitude in terms of the available solar energy that you're putting to ultimate use. The, essentially, a ton of algae um, is, is how did it go? Basically, a ton of tuna is equal to a thousand tons of algae. So for every thousand tons of algae you've got floating out there in the water, and then you get the small copepods, and then the sardines, and then the tuna, the little fish eating, the big fish eating, the, the little fish. By the time you run through that cycle, you know, there's only one-tenth of one percent of the initial available nutrient that you started with. One of the things that the aquarium colonies do for us by undertaking large-scale mariculture, when you bring this water up from the depths, you don't just get the, the energy differential. The deep water all over the Earth is loaded with nutrients. 
every place that there's a commercial fishery, it's the result of artificial or natural upwelling, bringing cold, nutrient-rich water to the surface. We'll be doing this artificially, bringing a river of this cold, nutrient-dense water to the surface. If we then raise algae at a large scale, which are extremely efficient, about 78% efficient at fixing the nitrogen available in the water, we can produce more than enough protein to meet the basic dietary needs of the entire planet from this marine resource. Um, Africa in particular, over, over the next 50 years, is going to be a very grim picture. Their population is pretty much guaranteed to triple. They're already in a terrible state and putting enormous pressures on the existing ecology on the continent. If we can bring in a, a reliable stream of low-cost algae, algal protein as a supplement to the diet in places like Africa, we can do a lot, A, to help the people of the world, and B, to slow the degradation of the ecological infrastructure. Yeah. yeah you always using airships hydrogen airships, it's a bit dangerous, isn't it, considering uh, hydrogen is extremely explosive. That's true. Everybody has in mind the Hindenburg, you know. I mean, it was one of the earliest videos, and uh, we've all seen it and seen the thing go up in flames and the, the guy screaming in the microphone. It's, it's all very dramatic, but we, then we all go out and get in our cars and drive around on 66 of dynamite in the, in the gas tank, think nothing of it. So, yeah, the, 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 the dangers are, are there. Um, I think the Hindenburg was a bad rap. That's a whole uh, uh, study unto itself, what actually happened to the Hindenburg. There's some evidence that it was sabotaged and, and, and blown up as an act of terrorism. Um, I don't know. I think that the problem is tractable, and it's worth doing because helium is in short supply already, and hydrogen has twice the lifting power of, of helium. So if you can do hydrogen airships, we will. But it's the ideal distribution system for a low-cost food supplement for the third world, where the, the main problem is often not the availability of the commodities or the price of the commodities, but the distribution. You, you get a ship, a cargo ship, to Africa, and then you can't get the, the, the wheat out to the villages. And airships would make that possible. Yeah. What is your understanding of your, your source of inspiration that led you not only to innovate on these subjects, but to this whole complex of ideas that ties together to the Diane vision? Mm -hmm. Do you see that as like a mimetic process arising from having read certain books, or do you see it as the mind of Gaia, or a possible future uh, pulling us ahead, ahead towards it, or how do, you, how do you look at that? Well, I think I'm just a, a product of our age. You know, I grew up as a kid with the space program. I can remember they preempted Tennessee Tuxedo on Saturday morning to launch a Redstone rocket. I thought that was great. And then in 1968, that was kind of the watershed year for me. I remember coming out of the movie 2001, A Space Odyssey, and I felt just like one of the eight men that had touched the obelisk. I didn't know what I had seen or what it meant, but I knew I wasn't the same creature I was when I went in there. And that revealed for me the vision of the future that I wanted. And in 1968, 2001, kept that scene forever. And I thought for sure I was be, you know, landed on the moon in one of those cool little spherical airships, you know, drinking mushed carrots by now. It, you know, it just seemed like our future was happening. And that this was unfolding. I remember in 1968, modern jet liners and airports were just so Jetsonian. You know, you go in there and it felt like you're going in the future and fool around with the little airflow valve and you just knew that the future was happening. I find it profoundly depressing to get on a jetliner. You know, here we are almost 30 years later and nothing has changed. It's all the same. And I kind of wonder, you know, what happened to the future? The future is just not what it used to be. There's the <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> Yeah. The vision as you, of, of going to space as you go through the, the ocean colony phase for 40 or 50 years, uh, people are going to be, oh, we want to be uh, oceanographers, we don't want to be space explorers. Sure. How do, you, how do you make step two? 
Well, I think it's, it, if you succeed at step one, a, a couple of things happen. For one, I think this, this conference this weekend is kind of indicative. I mean, here we are 20 years later, and you know, there aren't the thousands of people, this isn't a worldwide movement the way it was during the Apollo era. It's kind of, you know, a, a group of interested people, but you know, we're not really calling the tune in terms of the, the planet's agenda. If you can get a process kicked off in the real world that is growing and dynamic, I am perfectly confident that there are millions of people on this planet who would be willing to attach themselves to that process and commit themselves to it if it had demonstrated itself as being viable. 20 years after the ideas first became current, we don't today have any process we can point to and say, look, this is what's leading us to space. So certainly along the way, you're going to get millions of people who could care less. They just want to live, you know, a, a better lifestyle on a floating island and go to the beach and sip a pina colada. And that's fine, because even thereby, they will be part of the economic process that's taking us where we're going. But I'm confident that there will be a huge number of people committed to the process and understanding that this is that this is one of the leaping blocks to take us to the next step. Actually, I just want to get there and then wrestle with the problem. How are we doing on time? Any other question? Well, uh, yeah. perceive us as anything worthwhile at all, it's likely to be some version of lunch. So I'm, you know, I'm not all that optimistic that contact with an extraterrestrial civilization would be a good thing for us, but I'm not losing any sleep over it either because I think the chances are infinitesimal that that is, that that is happening. Um, if there were an interstellar civilization, I believe it would be, it would be overwhelmingly obvious but the moment they switched on that first radio telescope in New Jersey back when, they would have been bombarded by some variety of signal. 
and, it, and you can look across the spectrum. It's really, it's really very quiet out there, except for the natural stellar activity. There, there aren't, there aren't unidentifiable neutrino bursts or, or virtually anything that you could point to. I mean, there are gamma ray bursters, but that's not linked to any stellar system. There's nothing across the spectrum that you can point to. And I think there would be if there were civilization on the scale of K2 or K3 cultures. Plus, you know, the, the, once you've got civilization on that scale, the process of moving throughout the galaxy happens very rapidly, a million years. Uh, given five billion years to evolve an intelligent species in the first time, place there's been enough time for the whole galaxy to have been colonized 5,000 times by now, even if there were only one such civilization at a time. I mean, no one would pass up a, you know, a prime peach of a mean sequence star like ours. Because most of the stars are red dwarfs anyway. Many of them are binaries. This is a really good piece of celestial real estate from a star colonization standpoint. I can't see them passing us by. And so where are they? You know, and and I, I really think that absent any evidence to the contrary, belief in alien civilization is just wishful thinking. I wish they existed. I wish they'd show up. You know, even if they were hostile, at least we would know, you know, that, that something was going on out there. Well, thank you very much for your attention, and thanks for coming today.